I've got that time. I want you to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Uh, Carl Snyder was to be here speaking tonight, but Carl uh, is in uh, North Carolina uh, and uh, had to make a quick trip there. So he called me and said, I hate to do this to you, but I said, hey, it's okay. You know, preachers always keep one in their back pocket, right? Actually, I didn't have one in my back pocket this time. I went ahead and developed one today. Uh, and uh, I pray it'll be a blessing to you. Basically, I want to revisit a passage uh, that I used Sunday. It's not uh, Psalm 46, but it was the passage that I prefaced that with and uh, the story of Mary and Martha. And uh, point out something to you tonight uh, that I, I think is very important. Uh, it says in verse 38, if you'll take your Bibles, and I know I don't have it all on the screen uh, tonight, so you'll have to use the canon of Scripture you have in your hand, and that's okay, okay? It says in verse 38, Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, and we know that's Bethany, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Great thing to welcome Jesus into your house. If you haven't done that, you need to do that. He should always be welcome. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. <laughs> I don't think I want to tell Jesus to tell anybody to do anything. I mean, he, he's, he's the authority, right? And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, and I think when he uses your name twice, I think you better listen. You are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. And of course, Sunday I, I used that uh, uh, verse, be still and know, and I believe that's what uh, Jesus is telling her to do here. But the thing that stood out again to me was she sat at Jesus' feet. So tonight... I want us to learn at the feet of Jesus. Can you think of a better place to be? And you remember uh, that she was at the feet of Jesus another time in John chapter 12. And uh, she had that expensive uh, oil that she used to pour on his feet, which was uh, really getting him ready for his, uh, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And, uh, but that was at his feet. At another time when Lazarus was sick and Jesus waited four days and finally he came on the scene, we find that the word says Mary went and fell at his feet. So we find that she's at the feet of Jesus quite a bit. But in this particular case here, uh, we could say that she's there to worship him, and that would be a great thing. But I think she's there to listen to him and to learn from him because it says there in this she sat at Jesus feet and heard his word now you can read through scripture all you want but if you don't sit down and listen to what the scripture says and apply it to your life it's not going to do you as much good and so i think we need to find ourselves at the feet of Jesus and uh, that was the thing that stood out to me the most in that particular passage now when you go through there, you'll find that the cares of the household didn't matter too much to her. And the attitude of her sister didn't matter a whole lot. Uh, she wanted to hear the Word of God. And so um, I want to I challenge you today to make it a practice to hear the Word of God. Not just tonight, but every day of your life. Now, every person in the world is a learner, right? Right? Now, I heard a doctor say one time that you learn more from, from birth to your kindergarten years than you do for the rest of your life. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but I do know this. We ought to be learning every day. And uh, some of the things that we learn to do, we learn to crawl and then we learn to walk, right? Uh, we learn to speak gibberish, and that's what some of my grandsons are doing right now. And then you learn to talk. Uh, those that have learned to talk, they talk your leg off. Uh, we learn how to ride a bike with training wheels, and then we take the training wheel off, and we learn to ride it without it. Uh, we learn our ABCs. We learn uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic, or at least we should. And uh, uh, that's some things that you go through life learning. Uh, we learn how to eat. Some of us learn how to do that quite well. Uh, we learn what we like to eat and what we don't like to eat. Uh, we learn how to love, and sadly, you can also learn how to hate. 
So there's a lot of things that we learn as we go through life. And you know, when you think about life and the journey you're on, life has a lot of different teachers. Experience is a good teacher. When you think about it, going through sorrow, that's a, that's a good teacher. Uh, when you uh, think about the examples, those that people that you watch and what they go through in life, that can be a good learning experience. But also communion with God, having a fellowship time with God and having that special time with God can be an incredible teaching uh, element in your life. But I want to tell you tonight, and I know you know this already, the greatest teacher is Jesus Christ. I think that's why she wanted to be at his feet. You know, the Bible says that he spoke as never a man had ever spoke. And in that particular context, they were even say even the winds and the waves obey him because the authority that he had when he spoke. And the Bible does say that he spoke with authority. Now, I want you to think about it for a moment. Jesus knows more about the stars than any astronomer. By the way, wasn't Jesus the one that placed them in the universe? <laughs> Jesus knows more about flowers than the best botanist. You know what? God made flowers so colorful and so beautiful that only He could have done that. And He created that. Well, Jesus knows more about the human body than the greatest doctor. After all, He's the one that designed you. And He's the one that designed me. And, and I don't understand all the ins and outs of that, but I just know that we are more fearfully and wonderfully made, as the Scripture tells us. So I believe it would be wise for us to sit under the teaching of Jesus. And Mary chose that. Mary chose to sit and learn at the feet of Jesus. Now, when you think about our society today and you think about what's going on in our world today, I am, I am very, very concerned for my grandchildren. I'm really concerned for my children. They're, they, they are not living in the day, uh, in the times in which I grew up. You know, it was, you know, church was a, uh, a definite priority in a lot of people's life. It was a place where you went for fellowship. And I remember uh, after church on Sunday, we'd drive to Boonville every Sunday and we would sit on a porch and we would fellowship with our family. We would fellowship with our friends. You don't see anything like that anymore. But what's going on and what really concerns me today, not just for my kids and grandkids, but for all of us, is that there are so many voices in our world today that are vying for their attention. And you know what I mean. You, you see it uh, on a daily basis, and you see it in the news. You see, you see all these voices. But I got to thinking about it a little bit, and, and I want to share with you a few of the teachers who are still teaching in our world today. And um, by the way, they all have their doctorate degree. And I want to, there, there's five of them, and we could, we could go with more, but I want to tell you about five of them that are still propagating, they're still teaching uh, what they want to teach today. And, and I'm going to use doctor in front of all of them, all right? Doctor Atheist, have you ever heard of him? Well, have you? What's he, what does he teach? Well, if you enroll in his class, he's going to teach you that there is no God. And we know that that is being uh, proclaimed in our world today. And Dr. Atheist is going to teach you or try to convince you that there's no hereafter. There is no uh, heaven or hell. There's nothing to it at all. He's going to actually say there's no need for you to worry about the future. But what does it tell us in Psalm 14 verse 1? The Bible says the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. So we see the Word of God countering what Dr. Atheist says. But then there's Dr. Agnostic. Now he's going to teach you something a little bit different. He's going to teach you that I don't know if there is a God or not. Well, I've come across some folks like that. He says, I don't know if there's a future or not. I don't know if you have a soul or not. To him it really doesn't matter. But listen to what 1 John 5.13 says. And if you're a Christian, this verse ought to, ought to bring joy and, and happiness to you. It says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know. Not guess. You don't have to guess about it. But that you may know that you have eternal life. And that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. How, don't you want to hear that teaching more than you do about somebody that teaches, well, I don't know if there's a God or not? Then there's Dr. No Hell. You know, there are some people out there that don't believe in a hell, folks. 
They will not pick up the Word of God. They will not read it. They will not study about it. They will not believe that there's a hell. And this doctor will say, well, don't worry. There's no such place as hell. And he also teaches that the Bible is false and that the Bible is wrong. And here's something that he says, and, and I've, I have, I've had people in, in my witnessing endeavor say this, God is too merciful to send me to hell. What is it that sends somebody to hell, folks? It's not God. God gave all the provision that you could ever imagine as He gave His Son. It is the rejection of Jesus Christ that sends people to hell. Now, Luke chapter 16, verse 26 says, And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Now, we know that's uh, the uh, rich man and, and Lazarus. We know that he's talking about uh, paradise and Hades and there, that great gulf fixed between. But he's speaking about the fact that there is two places. There is heaven and there is hell. And that your destiny is going to be in one or the other. So Dr. Atheist, Dr. Agnostic, and Dr. No Hell tell us and teach us these things. But there's another doctor out there, Dr. Good Enough. You know, a lot of people feel like they're good enough. Just get to heaven and he'll, he'll uh, put you on the scales and if your good works outweigh the bad works, then you're going to be just fine. So this teaching is straight and to the point. They simply say, you are good enough. Don't worry about your sins. You're an honest person. You don't, you don't harm anybody. You pay all your bills. You've paid off all your debts. You are definitely good enough enough but what's the bible say for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god not of works not being good enough not doing so many things lest anyone should boast but the fifth teacher is this dr do better now dr do better will teach this i know you're bad but just do better in the future, and everything's going to be okay. Now, when you think about what, what the verse said in Psalm 14, verse 1, the fool has said in, the, in their heart that there is no God. The latter part of verse 1 of chapter 14 on, through verse 3 says this. This is God saying, they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. So God begins to search to see if there is anyone who understands and seeks after him. And here's what he says. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. Now we can go back to Genesis chapter 6. And you remember uh, the people were doing evil in the sight of God. And, and uh, they just kept doing it and doing it and doing it. And God said, I'm going to get rid of them. And he did. He, he sent the flood. But it says there, but Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Folks, it's not about being good enough and it's not about doing better. It's all about the grace of God. Amen. So these things are still, they've been, they've been taught over the years and they're still being taught. And, and our kids and my grandkids, they're going to they're gonna hear those things as they go through life. But I believe those are teachers, that what I call in the school of condemnation. It's not going to do anybody any good. They teach the wrong subjects. But we have read about someone who will teach the right things. And I want to sit under his feet and learn from him. Now, three things tonight about that. Here are some things we can learn from Jesus. We can learn, first of all, to know the teacher. Now, I think, Miss Janine, you may be the only teacher that's in here. Uh, you probably want your students to get to know you a little bit, right? And to, you don't? <laughs> Well, Jesus wants us to get to know him, okay? Uh, he asked the disciples a question one time. He said, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And, of course, you remember what it says in Matthew 16. Some, they said, some say you're John the Baptist, and some say you're Elijah, some say you're Jeremiah or just one of the prophets. And then Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? Now, you, you guys have been walking with me. You've been, you've been around me. You've been... 
Uh, I hope you've been learning from me. So who do you say that I am? And Peter, in uh, the way only the way Peter can do it, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Well, he got that right, folks. He'd make an A in that class. Amen. He got it right. Well, there were many other teaching moments in the lives of the disciples, and I, I believe they are teaching moments for us today. And I think I think perhaps the most important part of a school may be, may be the teachers and how they teach and, and, and how they interact with kids. Let me give you some names. Now, these names are not going to mean anything to you, okay? But I want to call their names out because I was proud of myself for remembering these. Miss Bundy, Miss Magruder, Miss Davenport. By the way, I had a huge crush on her. Mrs. Hayes, Mrs. Sampson, and Mr. Chamberlain. Those were my elementary school teachers. And to this day, 50 years later, I can still remember and recall some of the things that they taught. The writing, the, 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 the arithmetic, the reading, all of those fundamental things that, and elemental things that I needed in life that have got me to where I am today. And, and I appreciate uh, the fact that they made an impact in my life and they, had, they taught me some valuable life lessons. And the same should be said about Jesus. I should never forget the lessons that he teaches me. Now I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 11. You'll, re you'll recall this passage, uh, but go there if you would, Matthew chapter 11. Notice with me a lesson that we need to learn. Verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Isn't that great? Take my yoke upon you, and what? what's the next part of that? And what? Learn from me. So if we're going to learn from Jesus and learn that uh, when we come to him, he's going to take care of us, we need to really zone in on this verse. He says, I'm gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. We all need that kind of rest, right? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Oh, I hope you've learned that lesson in your life, that you can come to Jesus on any occasion. But what about the Sermon on the Mount? I want you to turn to the chapter 5 of Matthew. Chapter 5, verse 1. The Word says, And seeing the multitudes, He went up on a mountain, and when He was seated, His disciples came to Him. Now get the picture of this. There's a huge crowd, and Jesus goes up on the mount, and he, his disciples gather around, and here's what he says. He opened his mouth and taught them. Here was a teaching moment. He taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who persecute, who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice! Oh, I'd love to have heard him say that. Knowing that they're going to go through all of these things, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Life lessons. The disciples were learning things that would help them even after uh, Jesus had left. They would learn things. And you could look in the, the epistles. You can look in uh, the books of Peter and, and uh, even the, the books that Paul wrote. And you can see some of those life lessons coming to life that they learned from Jesus. So we need to know who Jesus is. We need to learn that. 
But there's something, something else we need to learn, and this is very important, and I believe very vital to our Christian life. We need to learn to pray. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We, we have dealt with it uh, quite often, and uh, here I did a series on prayer not too long ago. But I want to emphasize a little bit about prayer tonight. And by the way, there's no danger of prayer being taken out of this school out of the school of Jesus. It's going to be there. And the disciples wanted to really know how to pray. And if you look at Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 11, we find the disciples' prayer, what I call the disciples' prayer. We could also look at it in in Matthew chapter 6, but I I chose this one here. Uh, It says in verse 1, it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, here it is, Lord, Teach us to pray. Another learning experience, another time that we can be at the feet of Jesus. As John also taught his disciples, so he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, there's five lessons there that they were to learn. And these five lessons are what you need to learn as we sit at the feet of Jesus. The first one was learn to follow God, our Father in heaven. That's important. You need to know who the Father is. You need to have him, have Jesus as your Lord and Savior and, and, uh, You need to understand holy is his name and hallowed is his name and his kingdom has come and his will is to be done. So we need to learn to follow God. We need to learn to submit to his will. Not only that, we need to learn to depend on him to meet our needs. Did it not say there, give us day by day our daily bread? The fourth lesson we need to learn from that is we need to learn to forgive others. Listen to me, there's a lot of people that need to forgive others. I don't know if there may be a situation in your life where you're holding on to something, you're harboring it, and you're, it's, just, it's making you bitter. You need to just let go and say, hey, God, I'm ready to forgive others. Uh, and you can go back into the book of Matthew chapter 6, and it says if you don't forgive others, then God will not forgive you. You can go back and you can look at that. But the fifth lesson here is you need to learn to resist the evil one. It says there, but deliver us from the evil one teaching moments that you can take uh, and and use through your life i love what paul says in first thessalonians five seventeen. now you can memorize this verse are you ready tell me you're ready pray without ceasing pray without ceasing now if you can't if you can't memorize that come to me afterwards and i'll help you with it we'll go word by word okay Pray without ceasing. I believe that means we need to be in the attitude of prayer 24-7, 365 days a year. Be in an attitude of prayer. You're not going to go through all of your life and all 24 hours a day with your eyes closed. I do, most of my, I do a lot of my praying driving my truck. Not that people are trying to hit me or anything, but that's the time I'm in the truck by myself. And... It's just a great time. Now, I do not drive with my eyes closed, okay? We need to have an attitude of prayer, right? And I think it is a continual. And I I put it like this, and I hope you understand my heart on this. I would rather pray than preach. Now, hear me out. I would rather pray than sing. Folks, I would rather pray than teach. And here's why. I will not be able to preach, sing, or teach effectively without prayer. You see where my heart is on that? And so, I think we all need to have that attitude, pray without ceasing. Someone, and I I did not, uh, I, I just remember hearing this and and I believe I'm quoting it right. I just don't remember who, who said it. But they said, time spent in prayer is never wasted. 
And I've always remembered that. So spend time in prayer. And I'm almost out of time, so I'm going to give you this third one real quick. We need to learn to trust in Jesus. Now you think about Mary as she's at the feet of Jesus, and yes, she's in a in a, a worship posture. She is listening. She has opened up her heart to the Lord, and no doubt she had heard Him pray, and no doubt she had heard a lot of these valuable lessons that I've taught that I've ta- talked about tonight. But I'm sure she learned how to trust Him. What's your trust meter with the Lord? How much do you really trust Him? And I got to thinking about that, and my mind immediately went back to that man in the Old Testament, and we find him in Job chapter 1. Uh, the, the story is about Job, and you remember all that he went through. You remember that he lost his, his, his cattle, his animals, his sheep. Uh, he lost his children to a, a whirlwind, a tornado, and all of this happened to him. As, as you remember, Satan came to him, and God, God said, well, have you considered my servant Job? I think God knew exactly the heart of Job and what Job would would do. And even as you read on in chapter 2, you'll read that his wife, his his own wife said, "Well, well, Job, you know, you've served God all these years and you've got nothing for it. You've lost everything. You've got these boils on your body. Your health is decaying. And all of this has uh, has been done to you, but yet you are still proclaiming your love and your faith in God. Do you remember what she said? She said, why don't you just curse God and die? Aren't you glad that Job learned a different lesson than that? He learned to put his trust in Almighty God. And here's what he said in Job chapter 13, verse 15. I love this, you know, because his friends so-called friends got all over him and said, you know, there's got to be sin in your life or these things wouldn't happen to you. Well, here's what Job said in response to them. He said, though he slay me, though God take my life, yet will I trust in him. What a testimony. How about about the fact of trust? Have you learned to really trust? Trust in Jesus. It says in Psalm 37, 3, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on His faithfulness. It tells us in Proverbs 3, verse 5, you know this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I'm going to tell you, your understanding will let you down. It's happened to me a lot of times. I thought I had it. I thought I had it all right. Then I realized I didn't. And I was leaning on my own thoughts and on my own ways and not the ways of God. Well, folks, I would have loved to have been where Mary was that day. <laughs> been nice not to do any housework. You know, it wasn't so much that she didn't mind serving the Lord. She she certainly did, but that wasn't, her, that wasn't her focus that day. She was sitting at the feet and learning from Jesus. Well, we wasn't there that day, but I can truthfully tell you tonight with all my heart and based upon the Word of God that you can learn from the feet of Jesus each and every day of your life. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we thank You for Your Word. And Lord, uh, thank You for the lessons that You teach us. Lord, thank You. I thank You so much for the, the Scripture that You have laid out for us. Because it does tell us Your heart and it does tell us Your will. And God, I, I know so many times I don't abide by it like I should. But God, I try to. And I want to be obedient to Your Word and Your will. And God, I pray everyone in this building, Lord, uh, has that same desire. But Lord, I know I haven't learned it all. And uh, Lord, I, I want to learn things and valuable lessons from You every day. So God, as I plant myself at Your feet, Lord, would You just, um, just give me what You want to give me every day. 
I thank you for these folks. I thank you for our church. I thank you for our pastor. I pray for him right now as he is beginning the last night of the revival. And thank you for the, the results that have happened at Westside. And God, I just pray, Lord, you'll just empower Brother Mike tonight to preach your word with authority, uh, Lord, as he does here. So again, Lord, uh, be with us as we go into our prayer time. And I pray, Lord, that uh, that'll be very serious and, and will be uh, beneficial to our life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.